All right, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, and we're going to be in verses 7 to 11. Um, and the title of today's sermon is Don't Waste Your Life. I think when we really think about our lives, and we really think about what is the most important things that we live for, I bet there's all kinds of things that you would fill in the blanks. But I'd say, what's the most important thing to you? Why do you live your life? What gets you up in the morning? When you have those Monday mornings or Tuesday mornings, and you got to get up at 6 a.m., what wakes you up in the morning? When you're asked, stop and ask yourself the question. Maybe that is a depressing question. I don't know. Maybe you're like, I don't know. That's a great question, Bobby. Maybe you could help me because I'm really struggling with that. I mean, it's a question I think we all ask from time to time. Um, when, I was in, when I was in high school, I was a junior in high school, and this is where I believe I came to Christ and understood the, the gospel, understood what this was all about. Um, I remember we were, I, was at, I went to a Christian school, so like at, at my school, it was a, a private school, and and so one of the, you know, classes during the day, we had these, like, guys come in from a local college, and they came, and they were just speaking to us and just sharing what was on their heart, and um, they, they, all three guys were saying, you know, we really felt like God is just leading us to share this particular scripture verse, and um, if you were here for the Counting the Cost series, you would have heard this, but um, it, the, the scripture passages in Luke, Luke 9, is, if any man wants to come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. We will save his life, we'll lose it. Whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. What is it. What is it profit for a man to gain the whole world and yet lose his soul? And so I may have combined a couple of translations there, but the gist of that passage um, is that what is it profit for a man to gain everything and yet lose his soul? And these guys were kind of pressing in on kind of what is the most important thing in this life. If you get everything else wrong, but you got this question right, it's all peripheral, right? It's all peripheral. So if you were to gain, if you were to be the Bill, next Bill Gates or whatever, and you were to have billions, and you could buy private islands and jets and everything else, and you got that, and that was answered, and, and you got everything else family-wise, it was all just the way you wanted it, and things were happy, things were good, um, everything that you dreamed of comes true, but you, everybody's going to die one day. And when you die, you're not going to go to judgment and be like, oh, yeah, I'm, I'm just happy that was comfortable. Well, one, at some point, you're going to be like, what's, it's more than just this. If this is all we are living for, as Solomon says, it's just vanity. It's, it's all vain because it's, it's temporal. It, it's short-lived. And at some point, we have to come to terms with these harder questions of what is really the point? What's the point of it all? And when those guys had asked that question, and I'm, and I'm sitting there as a junior in high school, and I'm just wrestling with this and thinking, I don't, I think I've been living for myself. I think my whole, pri- everything and priorities in my life have been towards myself, my own dreams, my own goals, my own ambitions. And then, and then even as that, even in, in the college, you know, even, even further stretched and some more conversations with some mentors and those questions keep coming up. What's the point of it all? And for me, and I came down to it, and I, I believe this to be absolutely true. If Jesus is not everything, then he is nothing. If Jesus is not everything, then he is nothing. And it's an all or nothing kind of thing. It's the whole Texas Hold'em all in, right? It's all the chips on the table. It's all pushed in. This is what it's for. Last week, we went through 1 Peter chapter 4, and we hit verses 1 to 6. And, and as he walks through verses 1 to 6, he starts out with this idea in verse 1, Since therefore Christ suffered in the flesh, arm yourselves with the same way of thinking. And for whoever has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin, so as to live for the rest of the time in the flesh, no longer for human passions, but for the will of God. And he go, walks through kind of this whole idea that we're to turn from the things that ordinarily people turn to to make them happy. Things of the flesh. Um, substance, substances to make them comfortable. Uh, turning to uh, sins of the body and, and sex and lust to make them happy all sorts of things that we do, any kind of addictions that we set up, and we, and we look at those things and say, maybe this thing will make me happy. And he says, as a follower of Jesus Christ, we're to turn away from those things. Now, put them in their proper place, right? There's a proper place for, for everything, but when you turn to those things as an idol and you set it up in such a way where it is an idol and you worship it, that those, those things are then wrong and bad. And, and so he, he, he kind of puts those in a pack set, and if you kind of have some questions about that, you know, go back to that passage um, read some of those things, but things like, you know, for example, sex is good in marriage. 
between a man and a woman. And that's the, the, the way God designed it and purposed it. And that God wants to utilize that for this, those purposes. And so we see that those things, that there's a proper place and context for the, how God has put those things. But to the extremes, they're unhealthy and they take us away from the true worship of God. And so in, in the next passage, he's going to kind of lead us into, as you turn away from sin and turn to Christ, kind of what the positive side of that is. As you follow after Jesus Christ and you're, you're following after him and what glorifies him and what honors him, this is what a life of following after Jesus looks like. So let's look down into verse 7. He says, The end of all things is at hand. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another as good stewards of God's varied grace. Whoever speaks as one who speaks oracles of God, whoever serves as one who serves by the strength that God supplies, in order that in everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. So the first thing we see is that point one, time is short. He starts out right in verse 7, that the end of all things is at hand. Now this kind of sounds like if you were to read that or to hear that, you know, read at your church, the end of all things is at hand. It's like maybe you picture a guy who's like coming up like, it's all here, the end is here, it's coming. He's holding a sign or something, and you're thinking, okay, tomorrow the end is coming. Oh, we better, I don't know what we're going to do. And, and he's, he is, Peter is drawing an, an idea to the end of all things, and I think, Fancy, you know, $1,000 theological word here, eschatology, the end of things, the end of all. And, and I think he's drawing a, a parallel to the end of all things, that at some point, it's all going to end, right? The end of all things is at hand. And I think in, in some degrees, he was talking to the nature of this idea of the church and that as, as Jesus has died on the cross for sins, and now we're, we're entering this time period of the church, that we, we, the end of all things is coming. At some point, it's, gonna, it's coming, and we realize that it's gonna, it's, everything's going to end. Everything has a shelf life, and, and no matter what we value in life, you ever think about that, like, what, what happens when I die? It's kind of a morbid question, but like, if you ever think, what happens when I die? Like, will people remember me? Will they think, will they think well of me? Will they think good of me? How will the funeral go? I mean, there are kind of some morbid questions, but I think there's some questions that I think we should be asking, is, is kind of what happens after it? What happens if this world ends? You know, I mean, if you, again, if you turn on the news, and I don't say this to scare you, but just to kind of just help you realize, like, you, you read the news, and you read all the stuff going on internationally, and all the things, and it can scare you half to death. And like, okay, they have nuclear ability and we have nuclear. Okay, this, is not, this may not end well. You know, this can go really, really bad. And, and those kind of things can scare you. But we need to know and realize that this earth is temporary. And that at some point, it's at the very least, our lives are temporary. And we're not going to live forever. No matter how good medical science gets, they cannot stop the fact that people will die. You know, maybe we'll live to be 5,000 years old. I don't know, but we're still going to die. I mean, even if it's not from disease, somebody can kill you. I could be driving home on the road today, and someone wrecks into my car, and boom, I'm dead. You know, I mean, that could happen. And so he, he, the Peter, I think, is trying to get the believers to realize, okay, put yourselves in the right frame of mind, that this could all be over very shortly. So what's the point of living this short span in which we do, and how do we use it? to honor God and glorify his name. What is the main thing we should be focused on as people and individuals, families, churches? How do we focus our priorities and put emphasis where emphasis needs to be on God and his kingdom and not on ourselves? There are so many pursuits that I engage myself in that honestly, they're not going to, to matter for the sake of the kingdom of God. Individually, there's not anything wrong with those things. But sometimes I, I, I put still so much stock in those things as if those things are the most important things in my life. And if, again, if it's not Jesus, if it's not filtered through the lens of Christ, none of it, all of it is just secondary. It's peripheral. It's not going to matter in the grand scheme of things for eternity. And I get before God one day, and I'm like, oh, God, did you see that, uh, you know, I watched like 10, 10, this 10 episodes of this certain show in, in three days. Oh, that's pretty good, huh? No, God's not going to care about that, Right? nothing wrong with watching the show, but I mean, as far as like just me and my time, my, every, my energy, my effort, and what do I spend myself in? What's important? It's not all these peripheral things in which we do. The end of all things is at hand. 
Now, again, I'm not going to get into exactly what type of eschatology or, or whatever he's kind of pushing himself into. You know, I've got a, a, a certain perspective, and I'm sure you probably come from a certain perspective as well, but the main thing to understand there is that at some point this is going to end, right? At, it's, going to, it's going to look different, and we, we know that. Uh, biblically, and then just for a sake that we die. Um, I think also this, this shouldn't scare us, one. Two, this also shouldn't make us grab our lawn chairs and watch the fireworks. You know, like, well, there's some times where we think, oh, the end is at hand. Well, let's just go find an island somewhere. I'm going to pull up. I'm just going to lay on the beach, and I'm just going to wait for it all to happen, right? This is, at some point, it's all going to blow up, and I guess I'll just sit back and watch it happen. I think both of those attitudes are wrong because, one, we're afraid of what could happen when we know we're going to die at some point. It's not to be afraid of the world. On the other hand, we're not supposed to be excited about the, the end of the world or the end of our lives or whatever else, but to live for God. How can we make the best of it? How can we take what God has given us and use it for his purposes and his kingdom? He says, therefore, so again, he uses that, the end of all things at hand, therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayer. So the end of all things is at hand. We, we realize that this, this idea, this mindset should keep us like a good soldier we see in the last passage in verses 1 through 6. And he says, arm yourselves with this way of thinking. Think this way. Let this be something that import, implores you, that disciplines you, that I should be arm myself with this way of thinking. Therefore, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Again, I think he's kind of going back a little bit to this, this last verses 1 to 6, you know, and this idea of, of being self-controlled, you know, this discipline, be sober-minded. I think about those two, those two words in particular, being self-controlled and be, being sober-minded. Um, again, it's about to be January, everybody has New Year's resolutions, I'm going to go to the gym, or I'm going to go take deal on this diet, or I'm going to go read a thousand books, or I'm going to go do this or do that. And, and about February hits, and you're like, I didn't do it. You know why? Because we lack self-control, you know, when it's what it comes down to. And, and, and we, all, we all understand that. We fall in the same boat. Of, we, we all struggle with self-control. It's a really hard thing for us to, to control ourselves. It's like, why am I doing this? Why am I doing things that are very harmful to me and myself? But I think if we understand the mindset, because the end of at hand, and I want to make the best use of what I've been given, that I'm to be self-controlled and sober-minded. The idea of sober-minded, if you think about that, be clear, clear thinking, that I'm thinking clearly about what's around me. You know, you shouldn't see your, your family in the same light if, if, you're, if you're evaluating this passage, right? We, we don't take them for granted. But I see that my kids have been given to me by God and, and that I'm to steward them and to raise them up in a way that glorifies Him and that I, I pray for them that God would use them mightily for His kingdom. And that ultimately I'm raising, I'm raising kids for, for the Lord. And that that is a, something that falls on me as a, as a dad. That I'm to be a good husband for my wife because this is something that is, God has given me that role or responsibility. And that I should do that to glorify his name. But see that life is short and that these things are important. And so we get self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Exactly what is he saying here? You know, I mean, it's up probably some up for interpretation. I don't know exactly what he's particularly implying. I don't think he's saying here that, he's, that God will not listen to your prayers if you're not self-controlled or sober-minded, but I think it has more to do with the dependence attitude. If I'm, if I'm really trying to live and follow after Christ and, and follow after him, what does that naturally bring me to? My weakness. I am an inadequate human being, and I realize that every single day. When I read God's word and I read what he commands us to do and what he commands us not to do and I read his law, I see that I fall short all the time. I, it's, just, it's just the nature of it. And, and I, I want to continue to live for God and follow after holiness and, and let him conform me and change me into the image of Jesus. But when I read this, I realize that I am inadequate and I'm weak. And, and I realize that as I'm following after Jesus, it should drive me to my knees because I realize that I depend upon God every single day every single moment, right? That no matter how well I think I've got everything all managed and all the balls juggling in the air and look at my life is good and I've got this all taken care of, I need Jesus. I need Jesus. It's an illusion when we think that we have everything in control because we don't. In an instant, everything can be gone and taken away from your life. So again, I've shared this story a few times, but the summer we had, we've had flooding issues in our house so just for all kinds of stuff, and we think we were like, okay, we fixed it this time. Maybe we, maybe we kind of diverted it and taken care of it. But then, you know, the flooding issue happens, and we've got cracks in our foundation because I think our houses, they moved from like Hill Air Force Base back in the day, and, 
And so like all these houses have cracks in their foundation. So you get water and water comes in your house and it starts messing up stuff. And, and then what is the first thing that goes to your mind is like financially, okay, well, that savings that we were saving for, for this trip or this, well, that's gone because I mean, I've got to use this for, you know, this home repair thing. And man, like, I mean, like just one small thing like that can happen and just like totally take your, your mind out of this idea that you control anything. That, do we really have that type of control? We don't. It's an illusion. And, and we, we think we do, but we don't. And so that God would keep us focused on prayers, verse 7. He was focused on dependence on him. And then he says in verse 8, Above all, keep loving one another earnestly, since love covers a multitude of sins. So as we are following after Jesus, make sure that we understand what's most important. It's the idea of above all. I don't think he's saying only focus here, but he's saying above all in the sense that this is one probably that's easy to forget. Have you ever done like... Um, I don't know, as, uh, again, they go back to home projects. A home project, and you kind of are, you know, like when you first think about the home project, like, I'm trying to make my house better. I'm going to make it cool, and you're thinking about all you can utilize for the thing or whatever, and this is going to be great. This is going to be awesome. And then you get in the middle of the project, and then you start, you're dealing with sheetrock mud, and you're like, man, this is not going on the way I want to. I've got this big mountain coming off my wall, and it is not looking right. And you're like, why did I do this? Why did I do this? Because you forget, you forget what's most important in the moment. You forget what's going to happen when you're done and how it looks completed. You've kind of missed the main point. And I think it's very easy for us as followers of Jesus Christ to get so caught up in the duties, obligations, the task. I've got my list and I've got my list and I check off my list and my, and my boxes that we miss the main point. We miss the main point. And he says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly. As we're following after Jesus Christ, why is it that the, one of the easiest things for us to do is to stop loving one another? Right? We, we're like, oh, I'm, I'm following after Christ, but I hate this guy, and I hate her. That doesn't make sense. It says, above all, keep loving one another earnestly, for love covers a multitude of sins. You, you, we, we miss the main point when that happens. When that attitude takes over, you've missed it. And, and just speaking completely transparently before you, this happens all the time for me, where I'm thinking like, man, like, I'm, I'm falling for Jesus Christ, but this is a situation or this situation, and it puts me in like the, a foul mood or whatever. And it's like, no, that's not my heart. My heart shouldn't be to have a, a anger or bitterness here, but to love this person the way that Jesus has loved me. And that's in forgiveness. That's in showing compassion when I was against him and wanted to overthrow him and unseat him on his throne. And I'm to love one another earnestly, to arm myself with the thinking of Christ, it says back in, in verse 1 and 2, they don't throw the other one over, that we do them together, that we follow after, God, what glorifies your name? What do you believe in? God, I, I, wanna, I, I want to do the things that honor you. I want to I stay against things that dishonor your name. God, I want to love my brothers and sisters because of the love that you've showed to me. And now this idea of loving one another earnestly for love covers a multitude of sins. Have you ever just screwed up? royally went in a relationship with another believer and you just you made a mistake you know and maybe it was your fault and you know what it's that that hard part of just saying I'm sorry I messed up I made a mistake right that that happens we're human beings and we're again going back to the bible we're, we're weak we're inadequate we see your weakness and when we realize that and you go back to somebody and say you know what it was entirely my fault I messed up I was the jerk I was the one who did this and it's my fault it's amazing what that kind of attitude can do to restore a relationship. And I think with Christ, the same way that he has come after us, and he has showed his compassion and love for us, that love the way that he, his love has covered our sin, I think in a similar way, although it's Jesus, make sure we understand that Jesus Christ is the one who pays 100% for our sin, but to understand that we are to follow as Jesus has loved us and to love others the same way. In verse 9, he says, Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. So again, kind of in reverse from Last week, 1 through 6, he kind of does a list of some of the negative things. He's showing this list, 7 and 9, of some of the positive things. And he almost has like a little either motivation or condition right after it. So in, verses, in verse 7, be self-controlled and sober-minded for the sake of your prayers. Verse 8, keep loving one another earnestly since love covers a multitude of sins. And then verse 9, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. Some are motivations, some are almost clarifications. There are qualities on the way that we are to do these things. And I think because he knows the way that we think. And so this idea is interesting. Show hospitality to one another without grumbling. 
I think he's speaking to the church. Peter's talking to the church. He's saying, show hospitality to one another without grumbling. This idea of this word hospitality literally means love for strangers. Love for strangers. And he says, show love for strangers to one another. That's an interesting kind of dichotomy because you would think, okay, if you're to show love for strangers, but to do this to one another, how does that make sense? What is, how, do, what, how does that connect it? How do those two concepts kind of go together? Because if you're, if you're loving one another, then you would know these people. They wouldn't be strangers. But I think this has more to do with the, the bigger implications of the church. You see, as Peter, is, these letters that would go from, from church, they would get sent to other churches. And, and again, these, this church particular here was, they were scattered Jews. They were sent away from their homes in all these different places. So everywhere they went, what were they doing? They were going into new towns, new cities, new locations, and they were finding new Christians in these towns and new locations. And that they were to show hospitality, love for strangers to one another, to treat each other as exiles, realizing they don't have homes, and that we're to show hospitality to one another. I know many people here in this church, for example, many of you are not from here originally. And we've got some that are born and raised here in Utah. Many of our you know, military is nearby, Air Force Base brings a lot of people here. Um, we've got lots of different reasons why people come here to Utah. In this, this area, it's a growing economy and business, and so a lot of people come in. Um, and I know that for many of you, you've probably gone through the same thing. You know, you come to a new place. It's not your parents are far away or your families are far away. You've got cousins, aunts, nephews, all that all over the place. And whenever you go to go back to those places or whenever you're in those locations, you feel welcomed. You're like, I'm home. I'm, I'm with people. I'm with my family. And that's the type of attitude we should have with other believers, that we should have a welcoming environment for people who come in and having this hospitality. We're going to show love to strangers to one another. And we're to do this without grumbling. And I love how he kind of throws that little phrase on the end because I think the tendency for us to do, as, as if we're honest, is that it's, it's like, well, that kind of puts me out. And you realize, like, the way that the, the, the New Testament and the Old Testament, the way they showed hospitality is, like, way more putting them out than the way that we'd show hospitality. Like, if you were, again, going back to the Christmas story, it says there was no room for the inn. Mary and Joseph are looking for room. They're like, where do we stay? Where do we stay? Says, There's no room for them at the inn. Well, this, this, the word that they're talking about, inn, could, could mean uh, a number of things. It's kind of one of those words that kind of has uh, used for many different scenarios and situations. And that Joseph and Mary were going back to Bethlehem where their family was. And this word could also mean like a home or house or place, and, and that there, there was no room for them in the house. Well, some scholars think that this, what they were talking about there, was not like a literal inn, like the Motel 6. And they're like, no room at the Motel 6. There's no vacancy here. But they were going back to their family dwelling, and, and there was already family staying in the family dwelling that many of these houses had in the first floor, the bottom floor, a place where the animals stayed. And so the animals would come in, they'd go into the bottom floor of the house, and that's where they'd sleep through the night because it was cold, they would have food and that kind of thing. And so when they said no room for the inn, possibly, it's arguable, they were talking about that second floor dwelling. But the first floor dwelling would have been where the animals were staying. So they didn't actually not stay with family or in, a, in the Motel 6, but they were actually just on the same unit that their family were. They just were in with the, where the animals were at. And you think about this idea in the Old Testament that they, they were very hospitable towards others. They would welcome you into their home. They'd give you a place to stay. We went over, overseas, um, you know, to the Southeast Asia. Everywhere we went, they would offer us chai tea, and they would want us to sit. And sometimes they'd offer us meals, and they would want to cook for us, and they would want to, to feed you and welcome you into their homes. And it was some of the kindest people I've ever met in my life. And I think if that level of kindness, honestly, we, and I'm just speaking from, from my own self, it kind of put, takes me off my schedule, right? Because I'm like, well, I've got, to, I've got things to do today. I've got this, and I've got this going on, this going on. And, and that we shouldn't see each other as inconveniences, but we should love one another in that way to show love to strangers without grumbling because it glorifies God. And that we should have that type of attitude towards each other. It's not easy, right? But neither is following after Christ. And that's the attitude that we should have. And then the second point here is that we should be good stewards of God's grace in verse 10. As each has received a gift, use it to serve one another. So a couple 
couple things. If you're a follower of Jesus Christ, God has given you gifts. You know, these, I, here, here's my perspective and take on this. Or some would disagree with this, but I believe you see, God's giving you gifts. I think he's talking about a, a numerous, not an exhaustive list, um, you know, but, but numerous things, talents, strengths, abilities, everything that God has blessed you with. And that when God has given you those gifts, now some would say there's a, an exhaustive list of gifts and only these gifts that God has given you and you're supposed to take those gifts and that's the gifts he's talking about. But I think, he's, I think it's more implicit to who we are and everything that we've been given. He says, if God's given you something, talent, ability, something, resources, use it to serve one another. I think oftentimes, again, we, we often think that if, if as a, what I've been given, that it's mine, right? I've got my money that I worked for. I've got my talents, my strengths and abilities. It's just whatever to who I am. And, and I should use this for my purposes and my advantage, right? I, I don't think there's anything wrong with using it for things that are, you're using your, if you're a smart person and you're, you know, using your smart and intellect for your job. I don't think there's anything wrong with that. But taking those gifts that God has given you and seeing it bigger perspective than just just me. But taking those things and using it for the sake of to serve one another. It's the nature of the church coming together, right? That we have different gifts and different abilities, right? Daniel is great at playing guitar and singing. I would be, you would want me up here, right? That's not my gift. It's not my talent. It's not my strength. It would not edify the body. You would be running out the door, right? And that would, that's just the nature of it, right? And so some, some people have different gifts and you're gifted in certain areas, there's some ladies here that, I mean, we were talking about our children's ministry. Um, Bonnie and, and Lindsay put on, I mean, it's a fantastic ministry. And the ladies, those of you who serve in that ministry, you do such an amazing job um, with, with our kids and a kids' ministry. And that is such a needed area of the church. And that we, we know that we can trust our kids and that they're safe and they're secure. And, and even though our kids kind of go crazy and they may fight each other, and my son's probably one of the biggest instigators of it. He's here today. Um, but, you know, like that, we know that, that there's women that are gifted that way and they love on them and they, and they, and they want to teach them about the Bible. And it's like, that is, that's so awesome, it's so great. And then God has given each one of you different gifts and abilities. You're like, how can God use this? You know, how can God use me? God, God has given you something of who you are and God can use that for his purposes and his kingdom's sake, but we're to use it to serve one another. That we're to invest those things for the sake of the kingdom. And so as each has received a gift, use it to serve one another, verse 10, as good stewards of God's very grace. This idea of stewardship. Any Lord of the Rings fans in here? Anybody? Okay, so steward of Gondor, if you're like, okay, Bob, you've just entered nerd land, okay, but I'm sorry, go with me for a minute. Um, steward, he's like, the, of Gondor, he's like the, the guy that's supposed to be over this, like, country, this land, and he's supposed to be the one in charge of it, but he's not the king. Right? The king's supposed to come back, and the king's going to come back and, and basically say, okay, thank you for taking care of the land. Now uh, you can step down, and I'm coming back into power. We are to see what God has given us as stewards. Right? And even if you've watched the movies or read the books, you realize like the steward, he kind of let power go to his head. And he's like, I kind of like this. I kind of like ruling this land. I want to be the king. I want to be the guy in ownership here. I want to be the guy in authority. I want to be the guy who makes the shots, who calls the decisions. But the steward doesn't do that. The king makes the shots. He's the one who calls the decisions. He's the one who says, this is good, this is right. And we talked last week. God's the one who sets the standard of morality. He's the one who sets the standard for righteousness, for holiness. That's not up for debate or interpretation, right? God sets that. He's the one. He's the one who defines it. It's part of his character of holiness and his nature. And in the same way, that God is what he has given us, that we are to be good stewards, caretakers of what God has given us, because it does not belong to us, but it belongs to the king, and we are to honor the king and what he has given us for the sake of his purposes and kingdom's sake. So think of everything that you have. And you're like, well, Bobby, you don't really know. I don't have anything. So uh, joke's on you. Like, no, I mean, everything you have right? You're, the way you think about the world. I mean, whatever possessions you have. I mean, most of the world, or half the world, lives for under $2 a day, all right? So just think, just think for strictly financial for a second. So if most of the world lives for $2 a day or less, then what would that make us? 
That would make us wealthy. If you're making more than $2 a day, at the very least, maybe you're not, not necessarily wealthy, but you are middle class, you know, in the world standards. And, and you think even beyond that, just to think that comparatively, salary-wise, to, to the biggest populations, India, China, um, many of the others, Southeast Asia, Africa, I mean, we're not just considered, if you're making 30000 a year, 20000 a year, you'd be considered very wealthy. Very wealthy. Now think about that. Now I know that you can't always, it doesn't always apply because you're, you're certain things you can do and can't do and cost of living and all that stuff, but God has given you that. God has given you resources financially for his kingdom. How do you take those things and use it for his kingdom, right? This isn't just a, by the way, I'm not like trying to secretly appeal to give money to me or whatever, or anything like that, but say, how do you use this for what God wants? And I'm asking that honest question. How do you Ask, how do you find out what God wants and how he use what he has given me for his purposes in his kingdom? Some of you guys, you know, you say, you know what, I'm just, I just, I love to serve. I love to help out. I'm, you know, I'm, I don't even know what that means. We have guys who come every Sunday morning and they will come and they'll just come set up, tear down. They'll help set up children's ministry. They put up the signs and the flags. They go do all that. There's no recognition there. We don't, we don't put them up on the stage and say, hey guys, look what these guys are doing every Sunday. They do serve faithfully. There's people who serve, and they, they count. They're good at accounting, and they're good at financial things, and they help with the financial aspect of the church. There's people who serve in children's ministry, people who lead and worship. Um, there's people who do all sorts of things in the sake of the body because it's what God has given them, and they use it. But we're not to sit on it because it's mine. We're to use it as good stewards and invest it for the kingdom, right? To be good stewards of God's grace. And then he says, whoever speaks is one who speaks. So he then goes kind of some of these examples. Here are some examples. Whoever speaks is one who speaks oracles of God. Those who with speaking gifts should use them to speak about God, about what he values and what he wants. I think a couple things here. You think of this word oracles. These are, means like sayings from God. The, uh, prophetic oracle, if you've heard that phrase. A prophet would go up and he'd preach and he would say a lot of times, look at the Old Testament, Isaiah, some of the minor prophets, says, thus says the Lord, and he would go and he would share with the people, particularly the children of Israel, and he would share with them what God is telling them. And, and he's saying, if you're speaking, speak the truth of God. Now, let me tell you what that means and what it doesn't mean. What that means is not that whoever is speaking, whatever they are saying, is always going to be the oracle of God. That's not what he's saying. Right? But if you're speaking, to speak truth. Speak as if you're speaking the oracles of God. It's one reason why as a body of believers, you wonder why we go through books of the Bible. Because we want the Bible to do the speaking. Now, as a human being, I'm not always going to get everything right. There's passages, we've walked through some really tough passages, and I've kind of shared with you, and here's some multiple interpretations here, here's where I stand, and this is why. But we want the Bible to do the speaking. When someone gets up and says, I have a revelation or a gift from God and was a prophet, prophet, prophetic utterance from God, and they try to share with you what that is, and it contrasts Scripture, I ignore what that person is saying, even though they're claiming it's a prophetic utterance from God, and take what the Bible says. Because I don't want to deviate from God's Word. I believe that the Bible is sufficient for us as a body, as Christians, to know what He wants for us, to know what he values, to say who he is, who are we worshiping? Well, it's God. Well, why do we know this is who God is? Because we believe the Bible says who God is. We believe who I am as a, as a human being. The Bible says who I am as a human being. And so if somebody is saying something, ask them. And if you're not seeing any kind of verse here, scripture, like, where, where in scripture then do you get that verses? And have, have them point you to those verses. Because again, as a human being, I may say something that's wrong. I hope not, but that, that may happen, and you should call me out on it. You should ask me questions and feel free to and know that you have that freedom to do that. Ask me, Bobby, is that what the Bible says? Or help me, help me this clarification. This is what you said. Where, do you, where are you coming from that? Maybe you didn't explain that very clearly, and that happens a lot too. We want that to be speaking the utterances of oracles of God, not man's opinion. You care less about my opinion. But if it's from God, then we need to take it seriously. So there's an understanding that for speaking, speaking one who speaks oracles of God. And then he says in verse 11, whoever serves is one who serves by the strength God supplies. So there's a couple things here. One, that if we're serving, we should be serving in the strength that God gives us, that God gives us and has equipped us to serve him. 
So however he has gifted you, to serve in that way. Um, one of the things that happens oftentimes in, in churches and church life is that you get there's things called burnout. If you've been a Christian for a while, you may have heard that phrase. Well, maybe just, I'm just burnt out. I'm just burnt out from serving and burnt out. And I think that happens for a lot of reasons. Um, sometimes it's the wrong, wrong, the gifting that I think doesn't always match the, what you're doing. And maybe it's just the wrong fit. Um, sometimes, though, I think a lot of that happens because we kind of miss, right, the, the reason why we're doing this. I, to be 100% honest with you, as, as a pastor oftentimes, and I think, man, what's the, why am I doing this? Because I want to glorify God. And, and I realize that in the middle of all this, at the end of the day, have, have I lived for Jesus? Have I, have I preached the truth of God? Have I lived in a way that's honor and glorifying Him? Have I, even, if, even if I had a really difficult conversation here, did I treat this in a way that was honoring and glorifying to God? Right? It's, what's my motivation? What's my purpose? What's my, what's my push to keep going? If I'm operating out of my own strength, I'm just going to see, well, wait a second, this doesn't pay very well. I could do way better in the secular world and earn a much better salary and go, kind of go that route and probably have better hours even for my family. Maybe that's the direction I should go in. But no, it's not about that. It's not about those things. It's about that I want to, to follow God and what, he, his, his, what I feel he's called me to do and to be a part of what he's called me to do. And the same thing has to be for you, that you want to serve God in the strength that he supplies because he has called you to that and because you're following in what God has supplied you. And that we realize that our motivation cannot be for temporary things. It's not for acknowledgement. We don't do these things for, you know, recognition. We do these things because we want to glorify God. We want to follow Jesus Christ because he is king and he is Lord. That we believe that to be true, that Jesus Christ didn't just stay on a cross dead, but he rose again because he was the son of God. And that as the New Testament would preach that, no, this Jesus you crucified, he's risen. He's alive. He's walking around. He's talking to people. He's, a, he's really alive. Like, we believe that to be true. And I say, I believe this to be true. I believe Jesus Christ to be the only hope for salvation for mankind, that apart from Christ, there's no hope for mankind, that whatever you turn to to fill your life with, none of it will bring any lasting joy, that when you get to heaven one day, that we'll go before a, the, the judge of God and that we have to answer and if your name is not written in the book of life, there is no hope for eternity for you. But that we will have to answer. And I believe that to be firmly true. And I'm willing to give my life for that. Right? That this is something that is important to me. And that nothing else matters apart from that. And if we start serving for other reasons and we let other things creep in for why we do what we do, all of a sudden it all gets messed up. Right? The whole purpose, the reason why we're doing this, the reason why we're doing this is like, well, it's just a task list and checking off to, to do this week versus saying, I'm doing this because I want to honor God with everything that he has given me. And it may seem small and it may not seem grand and, and I'm not getting the recognition, but I'm doing this because God, I believe he's alive and I want to serve him and honor him and glorify his name. And what's what he says in order that everything God may be glorified through Jesus Christ. To him belong glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. The glory belongs solely on God. I'm going to finish with kind of this story in Acts 12. Turn over there real quick. Kind of this idea of glory. What is, what is glory? Right? Glory is the idea of recognition. It's honor. It's, it's the one who has, honoring the one who has done it all. Right? And giving it to that person. If you're watching the play up here, and you know, they're doing a Christmas musical up here at the Zeke Field. You know, there, there's the lead actors, and you've got those guys, and they're probably the ones, they, they call them out, and they go to the stage, and maybe they're getting roses, and they're getting, they're getting honored, they're getting recognition for what they've done, right? And, and when we go to our lives, at the end of the day, our job is not to make ourselves look good, okay? Hear, 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 try to understand what I'm saying here. Our main job is not to make ourselves look good, but to point back to God. He's the one who deserves all the credit, all the recognition. One day, in picture of heaven, right? It's, it's all these picture of heaven, the throne room, everybody's saying, glory, glory to God. And we've been given these crowns, and we take the crowns, and they, they all just give them, they point them at the feet of Jesus. Why? Because it's not about what we've been given. It's not about some kind of reward that we can say, say oh, look at me, I'm high and mighty, and look what I've, look what I've earned we give them back to Jesus because he's the one who supplied it, and he's the one who deserves all the recognition. Acts 12, verse 20. Um, well, let's go back to verse 19. And it's, or uh, let's see, no, verse 20, sorry. 
Now, Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon. Herod is, you know, the, the kind of the, Rome, or the, the Roman-appointed Jewish leader you know, over Judea in that province. And uh, he says, Herod was angry with the people of Tyre and Sidon, and they came to him with one accord. And having persuaded Blastus, the king's chamberlain, they asked for peace because their country depended on the king's country for food. On an appointed day, Herod put on his royal robes, took a seat upon the throne, and, a de- and delivered an oration to them. Oration. He delivered a great speech, a great sermon. He's preaching. He's preaching his heart out. And the people were shouting, The voice of a God and not a man. Immediately an angel of the Lord struck him down, because he did not give God the glory, and he was eaten by worms and breathed his last. But the word of God increased and multiplied. Here's kind of a story of this, this guy and he's in a position of power. He's in leadership. And he's getting up, and he's, he's just speaking, right? There's nothing wrong with the speaking. There's wrong with even a good thing that he preached or spoke. But the people are shouting, giving him praise, giving him honor. Herod, you're the guy. You're, it's like the voice of a God coming out of you. And he's just eating it up. He's just soaking it in. Yeah, yeah, that's right, right. Yeah, doesn't correct them. He doesn't point the attention back to God. It says God has give, it's God's to receive all the glory. And what happens is an angel of the Lord strikes him down, right? And then worms eat him. Like, it's a pretty bad way to go, honestly. I think worms are just devouring him. And, like, you think just because he did not give God the glory for what had happened. And I think any time, no matter who we are, whenever we point that attention back to ourselves, we're not worshiping God. I'm not saying that worms, it's not scary. It's not like a fable. Like, oh, well, tomorrow Bobby said this, so worms are going to eat me today if I don't do this. Now, I'm not saying that worms are going to eat you, but I'm saying that all of the glory, all of the honor for everything that we do, is to, everything is to point back to Jesus. If it's not pointing to Jesus, then what's the point? Right? If it's not pointing back to Jesus, then what's the point? I don't know what your focus is in your life or what gets you moving or what gets you going, but the question is, is your life lived for the glory and edification of God, or is it lived in order to glorify yourself for your recognition for some other motivation that you're trying to live for, another trying to achieve or to earn? And I can't answer that question. Maybe God's been speaking to you today and just said, you know, what is the point? Am I wasting my life? Is my life living, truly being lived for things that have value? Jesus Christ, are all living to point back to him or to live for anything else? And if it's for anything else, those things don't have that same value. Through Christ, those things have a lot of value because we put them in their proper place. But if, if it's not ultimately, if these things are the end in and of themselves, you are not going to find true, lasting joy or peace or, and, and hope in this life. There's going to be no hope. There's going to be no peace. There's going to be nothing here. And then especially in eternity. When you go to Christ and you say, God, well, I, I did. I was pretty good. I, I tried to be a good guy. God's not going to be pleased by that or impressed by any good that you try to put before him. But if Jesus is not the ultimate glory, if he's not the actor in the play, the, the play that gets, gets it all, right? He's the main character. He's the one. We're all supporting cast, right? We're all the guys in the background that God just, and not even that. God just uses us for his for chess pieces used by God. And we want to be, God, use us for your purposes in your kingdom. If you, if you said that, just to have that prayer, the, the, the boldness to pray that to God. God, I'm, I'm here and available, used by you for whatever you've got me to do. I I could care less about anything else. Jesus, I want to live for you, and nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. There's so many things, and I wish I could just plead with you and beg with you that not let those other things dictate who you are to be, but to let Jesus Christ be the center of everything, that he would receive all the praise, all the honor, and the glory, and ultimately, we would be in the background. One of my favorite quotes from one of the Moravian, uh, Moravian missionaries, and he says, Count Zinzendorf, he says, his, his quote as a, as a pastor, although, you know, he was remembered for this, but he says, preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. That was his motto, to preach the gospel, die, and be forgotten. You know, you think about that, that's a hard prayer to pray, honestly. Who wants to be forgotten? But ultimately, it's not my show, it's not your show. We preach the gospel faithfully, we faithfully follow after Jesus Christ, we die, and we're forgotten, right? And that Jesus is the one who's remembered for decades and decades to come. Right? It's all for him. It's all his. It all belongs to him. Let's pray. God, I just thank you so much.